Hello Essex, I'm Tom and you're watching Rebel. So by now you're probably wondering what all this fuss over NUS is about. Several universities up and down the country are holding campus-wide votes to decide whether or not to remain affiliated with the National Union of Students. What seems to have sparked all this is last month's election of the new NUS president, Malia Bouatia, which has caused a bit of a commotion. Some have even accused her of being an anti-Semite and an ISIS sympathiser. When you scratch under the surface of the sensationalist headlines, not all of this seems to be entirely true. Regardless, it does seem to have been the catalyst that started these campaigns to leave the NUS in universities up and down the country. So far, Lincoln, Hull and Newcastle have voted to leave, whereas Warwick, Exeter, Surrey and Cambridge have all voted to stay. None of the universities in the country are still waiting to vote, and that includes us here in Essex. So, here at Rebel, we've decided to sum up the debate and fact check both sides of the campaign in one quick video, so that you can make an informed decision when you go to the voting booth this week. First, let's talk money. The Student Union currently pays the NUS £41,300 to be a member, but that's not including other costs for things like sending delegates to conferences. The students uh, and the union pays extra for sabbatical uh, officers and other, uh, and other NUS delegates to be able to attend these conferences, paying for accommodation, for our travel fees and some other things. So that takes the cost to just over £43,000, which is round about how much debt most of us will graduate with. Now, bear in mind the NUS don't just pick this figure out of thin air. It's based on how many students the university actually has. So, on one hand, the figure will just keep going up year on year as Essex recruits more students. But on the other, with more students comes more funding. But the SU do make money back from the sale of NUS Extra Cards, around £15,000. So that brings our net contribution down to about £28,000, which is still a lot of money, but works out about £2 per student, which is less than the price of a snake bite at the SU bar. Still with me? Okay, good. So, the official out campaign, Essex NUS Skeptics, say that our membership ain't worth what we pay, and that we don't get any financial benefits from NUS affiliation, and we could be spending the money elsewhere. Here in Essex, we believe that RSU, we should be the most student centred organisation, and that means, in terms of money, that your money should be spent according to your priorities. Now, with the NUS, it's the case that we're spending more than £43,000 each year and only get a fraction of that back. And it's not spent according to what you want, but according to some nationally set priority. The in-camp, however, say that in the grand scheme of things, the cost is pretty low for all the things we can benefit from in return. The, the, the figure of 43,000 quoted um, isn't quite what we lose. If we take away the 15,000 that we get in NUS extra cards, um, which itself is, is mandated to be spent elsewhere in terms of our budget, um, we can't then spend that money if we don't invest that 43,000. So actually what we lose out is 28,000. Now take that 28,000 and see what we get for that money. We look at the research that we get. Fundamental campaigns that we run, preventing prevent, out in sport, tackling lag culture, all these things are things driven by the, uh, by the NUS. Research that makes it vital and easy for sabbaticals to make these campaigns. So now let's look at the democratic side of it all. The executive committee of NUS, which is made up of the president and the vice president, are elected at the national conference by delegates that we and other universities send to represent us. But of the 7 million students the NUS claim to represent, these delegates make up only about 800. Jake has said that it is a representative model, but it would be if every student was aware of not only that they could vote for their delegates, which they don't, and in some unis there is a turnout, a ridiculously low turnout of 1%. Essentially what this means is less than 1% of students actually decide who will lead the NUS each year. And for the past six years, delegates have voted against introducing a one-member, one-vote system where every student in the country can vote for the committee. But the counter-argument, of course, is that these delegates are elected by the students of their universities. Um, yes, to put it quite simply, it is democratic in, in any functional model. It runs upon a representative system in which, as many people know, we elect our delegates to uh, the National Conference for all students together. And that it isn't the fault of the NUS if students don't turn out to vote. Ultimately, what it boils down to is this. The NUS aren't not democratic, they just can't really claim a mandate. It's at this conference where the big campaigns of the NUS are decided. 
Here is where they set out their plans for challenging the rise in tuition fees or tackling the government on their plans to scrap the disabled students' allowances. But the Out campaign have argued that they also take stances on issues completely unrelated to students' lives, such as their campaigns against UKIP, or their support of the Stronger in Europe campaign, or their opposition to the State of Israel. The other side argues that these stances do have the broader interests of their members at heart, with opposition to Israel showing solidarity with Muslim students and that Britain remaining in the EU is in the interest of all students. Plus, these motions are voted on by democratically elected delegates. If we sit and argue over which yardstick and which to, to measure democracy by, um, whether we choose to have an indirect process in which we elect presidents or whatever, um, I think we lose sight of the national vision on which we should have, a national united voice for students. And that's what the NUS provides. So with this national voice, what else has the NUS been saying? They put a lot of support behind liberation groups, with campaigns such as tackling lad culture, consent education and out in sport training. They've also launched a green impact initiative, which is helping SUs to reduce their carbon footprints. And they've campaigned to prevent the deportation of thousands of international students on tier 4 visas. But their largest current campaign is probably Preventing Prevent, which provides resources and research to students' unions in helping them tackle a government policy which they, and many other universities say, targets and vilifies Muslim students. But what matters, other than making the government feel bad, or actually protecting the students which Preventing Prevent research is actively done? Now, I would take protecting Muslim students from Prevent over making the government feel a little bit naughty about what it's done. But of course, the Out Camp has been pointing to the failures of the NUS in the past and more recently. Today, the NUS has failed students consistently. Whether on tuition, fee, tuition fees, whether on prescription fees, whether on disability cuts, whether on the Prevent scheme which is being pushed through by this government, the NUS is no longer effective at representing students and their interests. And on top of this, it recently emerged that the organisation spent £54,000 on party political campaigning at last year's general election. Whilst the Leave campaign point out that no NUS money should be spent on anything specific to one party, the Remain camp say that this money was spent campaigning against candidates who'd broken their promises to students, such as Lib Dems who'd supported the rise in tuition fees. Ultimately, what it boils down to is this. Are we stronger together or better on our own? The NUS sceptics point to Southampton, who disaffiliated in 2002, and Imperial College London, who left the organisation in 2008, who they say have still been active in national campaigns, but have been able to focus more on the specific needs of their students without the big bill from the NUS. We've had much noise, nearly no student focus, and nothing to help you get on with your studies, make you better off personally. By the way, if we smash up the NUS and the government turns around and tomorrow goes, you know, the NUS is dead tomorrow, and the government turns around and goes, I'm going to put council tax back on students. How are we going to fight that? What organisation are we going to use? And how are we going to collectively bind together as students to actually hold the government to account on that issue? Whilst they admit there are areas where the NUS need to reform, they argue that we're in a better position to help shape its future from within the organisation. And of course, their worry is that the NUS will fall apart if enough students' unions leave, and then there'll be no national student voice whatsoever. So, which will it be? In or out? Leave or stay? Do we really get our money's worth from our membership? Are we stronger as a union when we speak on national issues? Is it better to be inside the tent pissing out or outside the tent pissing in? In this huge mess of pros and cons, there's a lot to consider. But at the end of the day, all that really matters is what you, the students, think. And we hope we've made things a little bit clearer for you to make up your mind. I've been Tom Hunter and you've been watching Rebel.